good morning, Dr. Munoz. Thank you so much for uh, joining me this morning. Um, uh, for those who don't know you, and I've known you for a couple of years now, um, can you uh, let everyone know kind of your background and, and kind of where you where you come from and what you're doing now and, and how uh, you see um, yourself with kind of what's going on in our in our current environment <laughs> <laughs> well first of all thank you very much for having me but like that's too big a question yeah. i need to break that down in okay. like several small pieces and try to <laughs> answer them as uh, quickly and succinctly as i can so well um since you asked where i come from i'm actually i was born in west germany but uh, right after the wall came down i moved over to east germany and helped like um, rebuilt there the education sector. I taught at Dresden University as my first job and then uh, came here. Well, first went to Canada, got a master's in economics in addition to my um, business education that I had in Germany and then um, got a PhD here from UCSD. Um, I'm a trade economist by training, but then um, yeah, I taught at the Kellogg School at Northwestern for a while, then came here um, and and so found, uh, here I founded the Institute for Spatial Economic Analysis uh, uh, in response to the Great Recession, the crisis there, in order to track what's going on and uh, how things play out in kind of uh, across space, across geography and over time. And um, so that's what I'm doing right now. I'm looking at, you know, how um, employment, how workforce develops over time, what the effect of automation specifically will be. That was our um, big hit from the Institute in terms of um, figuring out how much different regions will be affected. And so that plays directly, I think, and that's the last question that you had, that plays, of course, directly into what's going on right now with the uh, COVID-19 a virus as uh, a lot of the developments we expected to appear on our doorsteps just in a couple of years may now come much faster meaning specifically that uh, wherever uh, there is uh, human involvement that may jeopardize the strength of the supply chain and the strength of delivery of services um, in the future, for future pandemics, uh, companies may opt for automating that as much as possible to uh, yeah, ensure that they can be able to deliver. Right. And, and I think that, you know, for those of us who run in kind of the economic development circles and the county and circles, we kind of know you, but I think a lot of the general public and a lot of our members, you know, are not as familiar with you. So um, that's a great kind of a uh, way to kind of introduce who you are to a lot of people who don't know you. Um, and you had referenced something. So you, you had uh, uh, provided a, an opinion piece in, in Market Watch online. Um, and I found it fascinating because, you know, you have talked for the last few years about automation and what that means to, especially the Inland Empire with what's going on here. Um, and I think, and now it takes on a whole different role. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> you've said in it is that now it goes from what you thought might be taking place in about five years um, might be taking place in the next year or so. Yeah. So yeah, like the, uh, I, I sometimes felt like um, the, the, the preacher, the prophet in the desert um, saying, you know, like, hey, look, we have kind of like a booming economy. <clears throat> and so, you know, everything looks great. It's hard to get uh, qualified labor for the jobs that uh, are available out there. And yet I was standing there and say like, hey, that's not going to last. Um, so there will be the situation where, like, since robots have gotten so much more capable and cheaper at the same time, we've seen developments like that before a plenty um, be prepared, uh, specifically our lower educational uh, workforce will be at relatively great risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in and order to uh, yeah to to lose their jobs, and that we may have lots of people actually who need a lot of retraining, and so a lot of people took that like uh, so oh yeah we're going to see gigantic unemployment rates. That's not what I said. I said um, well I said that we might see large unemployment. Um, for certain periods of times when new technologies hit and are rolled out in certain sectors. Um, but uh, I 
continuously pointed towards the need to retrain and be ready to retrain. And now we're put in a situation where we need to you know, stock up those capacities very quickly. Yeah. And, and we had talked just prior to this about how integral a role with the workforce development boards are probably going to play in the next year or two having to do with that. Um, one of the things that you had referenced in the article was, is the two industries that um, are really probably going to be impacted the most are um, the, the, those of the uh, manufacturing supply chain mm -hmm. um, and then the industries of the direct consumer contact also mm -hmm. as the high touch industries, which was surprising to me because we've talked over the last few years about how mm -hmm. that high touch industry is probably the least likely to, but because of this whole new norm that we're in now, that changes everything. Yeah, I mean, that was a new learning, quite frankly, for me too. So, you know, I, I was completely in accord with what you just said and saying, well, you know, um, yes, there will be uh, the possibility to replace any waiter in uh, any type of restaurant, but how likely is it going to be that you'll see a high-end restaurant where robots are buzzing the tables? Well, not very likely. I still don't expect that to be very likely because I do think that we will develop new types of um, technologies and opportunities and possibilities to actually deal with um, the safety issue that comes along with it. Um, but on in general, you know, there's... Uh, the, the large probability that even places like Starbucks and um, fast food restaurants will eliminate customer contact as much as possible in order to, yeah, uh, get the, the, the product to the consumer that is more risk averse and uh, doesn't want to see as much um, human interaction. Yeah. And I think it also plays into not just the automation, but also is, is, it's the the processes right it's the like you say in the restaurant industry it's it it may not be necessarily a robot mm -hmm. busting tables but the process of how tables are bust or how mm -hmm. food is delivered is yeah. going to change dramatically which is going to one impact the restaurants themselves but two possibly create or expand current industries that are already in place when it comes to food safety um, mm -hmm. and, and those types of things. Well, actually, we always expected the sous chef to be gone. So yeah. we always expected the, the hamburger flipper to be gone. Yep. And so, um, and, and that's just reinforced. So every, the, the expectation was that everything that's not visible to the customer would be facing a larger probability to be automated while everything that's directly customer facing and since we're social animals uh, everything that has to do with human interaction would actually thrive and do better than uh, even right now because there's more capacity for that and more opportunity for that and so like you know instead of having um, one person waiting a table you may have like several people that want particular takes care of your wine and the other one of your food and the other one of whatever. So as you already see it in some of the higher end restaurants. And so I expected that to expand. I expected all the, um, the, the leisure and hospitality and arts and entertainment um, to become a lot more socially interactive. And now there's a big question mark all over that. Right. Yeah. Um, you also had uh, mentioned in the article is, is that so the current environment of automation has obviously never been better, mm -hmm. the advances in technology, but we're also at a different point where we've got these ultra low interest rates, large sectors with, um, you know, low valued workers, you know, to an extent that can be re easily replaced doing repetitive tasks. Um, and so, you know, low corporate taxes, you've got corporations mm -hmm. who've been sitting on money for years. Um, and this creates a whole new opportunity um, mm -hmm. in this, in, in what we're talking about as far as the automation and such. So mm -hmm. um, this is, I think, where you're referencing this is this ramping up of mm -hmm. going into the automation aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. So, I mean, there are two aspects to this. Uh, number one, for investors, what's coming up now is probably going to be one of the largest wealth opportunities that has ever existed in human history. So human economic history, as we, as we know it. So um, people talk about uh, seeing the first trillionaires. So and this, this is big. This is going to be big. And um, 
the uh, that's the one side the other side of it is really yeah there are lots of new opportunities for those who have the educational level for uh, uh, jumping in who have the money the creativity the, the business ideas uh, for entrepreneurship there's lots of opportunities but there's also this other very large slice of our society that uh, yeah we are specifically prevalent here in the inland empire that I would say does not have the same set of opportunities ahead of them and so we really need to be ready for putting emphasis not only on the new opportunities, but making sure that there are not large slices of our population being left behind. Yeah, and, and one of the other aspects of that too, and, and I know there's been a, a large push, I know down here in our region when it comes to the biotech industry and high tech uh, industry, um, mm -hmm. yesterday had seen uh, a report on CNBC about how the next wave of technology companies is going to probably grow exponentially because um, you have all these different aspects of whether it's the biotech aspect, whether it's the uh, high tech that's needed to uh, facilitate the automation aspects, um, you know, and, and getting to that next level. And so that could be that other aspect. And that could be one of those areas where there are obviously opportunities, whether it's, you know, hmm. University of Redlands, UCR, um, that help to facilitate some more of that growth in our area. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, this is one of the aspects that uh, I repeatedly mentioned in the past. And so, so <laughs> for those who've seen that before, I apologize that I repeat that. Um, but, uh, you know, like, uh, if you look at the uh, industry, indes revolution or all the economic revolutions that we talked about the internet revolution the digital revolution and so on they were all actually built on one major technology that drove it and so um, and it's always been you know great in the long run for creating jobs but it also took away jobs for some people because it was disruptive so what's really a lot different now than what we've seen historically is, is just what you mentioned, actually. It's not one technology, but de depending on whom you ask, it's about seven or eight different ones. Um, it's mobile robotics, it's 5G, it's um, uh, blockchain, it's uh, the um, biotech, it's nanotechnology, all basically coming to a level of what I call the ripeness of um, being ready for entering the market. Um, and so now you have what economists call uh, hybrid growth, meaning that you have uh, several technologies being able to complement each other. And then by that, producing really explosive growth. So arguably, in each one of those technologies that I mentioned may not have the same power as, say, electricity or the steam engine or um, the internet. But in their combination, um, it's, uh, yeah, an incredible set of opportunities that uh, yeah. can unfold. And our goal, of course, at this point needs to be making sure that we as a region and, uh, well, not like and as a nation, but like specifically here as a region can benefit from it as much as possible. And so, yes, the, um, the different universities that we have here in the region all have different qualities, different emphasis, different aspects of moving forward, but it uh, will require really a concerted effort um, of, of pretty much uh, all the different educational institutes and institutions, not only, only universities, all training facilities that we know to make sure that uh, we can benefit from that. And if I may just add one more aspect yeah. to that is one real thing that uh, is, has been, you know, clear for economists uh, for a long time is the moment that automation reaches levels and capabilities um, that it allows to literally compete with wages overseas, there's a huge opportunity to bring back mm -hmm. manufacturing and bring back certain services that have been uh, you know, provided to us from overseas. And so now this is paired with uh, pretty much strengthening and fortifying the supply chain making sure that uh, we don't face the same supply chain risks anymore. And so we do expect to have a lot of opportunities here just by repatriating things. 
But the jobs that will be, of course, offered in those new manufacturing industries will be entirely different than what we've seen before. And that's challenging specifically for us, because who says that those jobs will come to the Inland Empire? And uh, who says that our logistics sector, if we repatriate a lot, will still be as strong because, you know, like if you have less to import, then the ports will not have as much uh, jobs to do. And then also the warehouses will not be as full as before. So there's a lot of opportunities, but a lot of challenges ahead. And it's really necessary that we start thinking about those right now. And, and I, I think that's a perfect point because... Just like you said, we've seen this disrupt, disruption in, in the supply chain because we were so dependent on so much coming from China and other places in, in the world that now we have to look at that. How do we do that? And I do think that, that, is, that it's that you know watershed moment to kind of bring it all together. Mm -hmm. But I do think that positions the Inland Empire to be that perfect opportunity because even though we still have the relative location of the port, we have the ability to expand that manufacturing base here. We've got the, we've got the workforce, we've got, you know, the technology is going to be coming with that, you know, no matter what. But I think that that plays into what we were talking about a little bit ago was, is that idea that workforce development boards need to start thinking about retraining and, and working with those who are looking to get into the workforce in a totally different mindset. Now it can't be, retraining just for you know the you know that typical warehouse position it's now going to have to be a much more higher skilled level of mm. training that they have to look at it's not only that if i you know I, I first i agree with everything that you say but i would like to add that the um, first of all, you know, we have an infrastructure here specifically in the Indian Empire that makes us a really great uh, landing point for companies that want to repatriate um, and move forward because we do have that strong logistics sector and they still need to distribute across the country and we have everything for that set up. We have the space. Um, but we need to still be prepared that, you know, if you look at the logistics sector per se, there's a 75% automation probability. It means we will have the technology or have and will have the technology within the next 10, 15 years to literally replace 75% of the jobs in the logistics sector. And some actually say it's more than more like 90%. So um, that's coming out of Georgia Tech, this number, not from me. So uh, like my data more says like we're in the era of 75, but Georgia Tech is the leading logistics, uh, uh, arguably one of the leading supply chain and logistics uh, universities in, in the country and the world. So, you know, I mean, I at least want to mention it's not, we're not at the far end of the spectrum here. <laughs> and so what we, what we really need to be aware is that we have a lot of workers uh, that are ready to jump in the manufacturing sector, but we don't have the educational levels for a lot of them um, to really come in and um, have that human-machine interaction level of skills that's going to be need in the future and we need to forget about everything that we with, that we've built in terms of like certification and sort of um uh yeah well um uh, degrees i mean degree there's still a role for certification there's still a, a role for degrees but they have an entirely different role to play in the future right. than they than they have right now and so it's skills that need to be trained that are ready and we need to create skill profiles for people, for regions, for companies, um, so that we exactly understand what their current skill sets are and what their skill transition needs will be in order to um, be ready for that um, f for that particular move, for this particular change. And that's actually, um, you know, one of the core things that I'm working on right now to uh, find out what are the skill profiles that are currently there and what will be needed in the future so that we can prepare our region. And uh, I mean, we're doing it for our, the whole United States. Uh, so prepare us here overall so that we know which industries are actually the perfect fit for the Indian Empire and where do we have the highest competitiveness. And I think that's uh, one of the core things to, to look at. Yeah. I totally agree. Well, I want to thank you for your time, Dr. Munoz. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add, but I also wanted to give you the opportunities. If anyone wanted to find out more information about kind of the, the research you're doing or, or kind of some of these, these uh, articles that you've put out, is there a spot for them to go and check that? 
Yeah. Yeah, we're just uh, like as we speak, um, we're um, reworking our website. Um, so you may not find everything on it right now, but the the website address is uh, www.icpublish.com, and IC stands for Institute for Spatial Economic Analysis. So I S E A publish, just in one word, dot com. And I invite you to to go there. And there you can also, like, there's an opportunity to contact uh, us then directly and, and um, find out more about the work that we're doing. And so, you know, like, and I actually want to close with what you had started with, and that is, like, it's a huge time of challenge, but it's also a huge time of opportunity. We've been unwillingly catapulted into the future of work almost overnight. People are now doing so much more online. They know how to shop online. They know how to do meetings online. They know how to do um, a lot of remote work. Quite a bit of that will stay, and it will stay to our benefit because it's now people have learned how to use it more productively. And so let's make good use of what we're seeing. Uh, let's jointly figure out where the opportunities are and um, dig into it to make the region prosper even more. That's great. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate your time. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for Thanks. having me. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.